Everybody, let's start um, lesson four of the second period. Do you have any general questions at this point regarding exercises or course overall last week? Yeah. So we're now well, even halfway halfway through the course. So we've done geometric objects, geocandas, geocoding, special queries. Then today we'll continue with kind of uh, geometric operations overlay analysis a bit, and then uh, start to do well do data reclassification, kind of having in mind choropleth mapping, so thematic maps which we will then be focusing on fully next week. So visualis visualization, static and interactive maps. Then we'll do some open street map data fetching and network analysis. So kind of this network distance stuff. And then there's a little, the se seventh week is a bit more tutorial type. So there's no, there might be some in-class exercises so you can get familiar with the tools. But then on week seven, the pra practical session is dedicated to you working with the final assignment. So I'll introduce the final assignment topics next week, uh, but just kind of generally there will be three options. So there's one related to this travel time matrix data set that you will also use in this week's exercise. Then there's another topic kind of related to ur urban analytics in general. And then you can also choose your own topic if you have a thesis or some other project <coughs> you're working with. The general idea is that you are making some repeatable code for automating a GIS process in the final <coughs> exercise. And then uh, the one with the travel time uh, data has a bit more detailed instructions. So that might be easier to do if, you, if you're kind of wondering what, where could you start. But if you're then having your own project, maybe then uh, send me a message or come and discuss and we can check that it matches the uh, exercise requirements. But I'll post the detailed instructions before next lesson. So you can already start working or start thinking about it if you want. Um, sure. But yeah, uh, last exercise was about geocoding, buffering, uh, calculating populations within the shopping center buffers, buffer zone. So how's that going? Kind of a nearest neighbor analysis. OK, so you have the deadlines on Wednesday. Then and today indeed will go a bit more deeper into overlay analysis uh, and dissolving geometries first part and then reclassifying data. So this lesson is hopefully a bit less heavy than last week's lesson. We're here now uh, until six or let's see when we have the break. And then as I suggested in the message, so those of who you want uh, could then move to the GIS labs after the break uh, let's wrap up these topics if there's still, still something and then I could show how you can actually download and install the Python tools on your own computer so you can continue working with Python after the course as well. The CSC environment will be available like until uh, undefined future but of course like if you are using Python in your research or such it's also then good to know how to install and update the environment yourself. So that's not compulsory. I'm not grading you on your abilities to install things, but just now that you already know how to use the tools, it would be nice to have them available for you also offline on your machine. So that's the schedule. Um, uh, yeah, any questions on the final task at this point? Exercise three schedule today. Uh, so let's start from lesson for topics. So as you can see, there's two, two broad topics, geometric operations and overlay analysis. Uh, so last week, what we did, uh, we did uh, attribute joins based on spatial location. So this S join, spatial join, which then if we had, you had some kind of, maybe in the exercise you had, had the grief in here. And then there's some kind of a buffer. So then you might have joined, and this is buffer number one. So then you might have joined information to all these grid squares that they, are, they intersect with buffer one. So we did that. But this week, we'll uh, continue with overlay analysis so that we actually change the geometry. So we can then uh, 
create new objects uh, based on the spatial conditions. So it's a bit different thing. The conditions are the same, but then the output actually modifies the geometries. And then uh, the data classification part, which is quite nice. Uh, so let's start here. And let's start so that everybody has the CSC notebooks working. So you can click, click in there. I have mine already open in here. And you can find the notebooks under AutoGIS notebooks, notebooks, lesson for uh, geometric operations. So I'll check that everybody's at this stage. Uh, okay, so overlay analysis, a bit based on what we learned last week. So we have these different conditions, intersections, uh, and so on. So kind of this set, set logic that we are again using. Uh, and as I mentioned, so far you know how to combine data based on attribute, attribute joins, so some common key, and then based on these spatial conditions. So this spatial join, uh, or S, S join in GeoPandas, and now we'll see how we can make uh, kind of new shapes uh, based on overlay analysis of uh, two different spatial objects. So if you didn't yet do, we'll need to also download the input data. So I'll do like this. On the command line, you can just navigate to this lesson four folder. If you want to copy that. Um, and copy pasting happens if you press shift and paste, or shift and uh, mouse to click and then paste. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, and there I have a typo. Basically, you want to go to, uh, sorry, first. So we want to go to C D auto G auto G I S, then C D notebooks, and then C D notebooks C D lesson four. So there's a little typo. I'm missing the auto G I S folder in between, but you want to be in the same folder where these notebooks are located on the command line. So work AutoGIS notebooks, notebooks lesson four. And in there, uh, you can then copy paste this command. So wget, uh, and then there's a link, download link, uh, which downloads a zip file and then unzip lesson four data dot zip. So after you do this, uh, in a moment under this lesson for folder. Uh-huh, okay. Is there yet another? Well, it doesn't matter. It unzipped them now to the root. We can then see how our uh, file paths match in the notebook. So yet another, another typo in there. But did you manage to download and unzip some data? They might now be in the root folder, but let's not uh, worry about that yet. So what we downloaded, there are there is one shapefile. So you remember that shapefile always comes with these uh, kind of many different little files. So the shapes, uh, then the table, uh, then the index projection information, and other, other little uh, files. Then there is uh, a line. Amazon River Polygon, uh, sorry, line shape file, and then there's Helsinki Borders shape file. So with those, we can then start working. I'll close this. Uh, ask your friend if if this went too quickly. So you should have downloaded and unzipped the file, and let's read them in so we can do some overlay overlay analysis. Let me take this from here. Uh, so we'll need to import, I'll also close this one, uh, import at least GeoPandas as GPD. Mm, and let's see, we can start with that. And then there's now two layers we want to start with. Uh, so we have a border, one border uh, file, and then we have uh, a grid file, we'll soon learn more about these input files. So now we need to find the correct uh, file path, now that we don't have them in the data folder. So you can 
uh, Helsinki borders is the one that we want as the border file. So one way to do that is to copy the name from here, or you can type in uh, Helsinki borders shapefile. And then the grid file is this travel time, travel time data. Uh, and from there also we read in the shape file. So you can copy that as a character string as well. And then using these file paths, uh, we make two, two uh, variables. So Helsinki or Hel using GeoPandas read file, uh, we have the border file path. And then we will have grid, which is then GeoPandas read file and then grid file path. So a bit repetition of how to read in shape files. It's the default driver in GeoPandas. We just give the file path in this case as they are all located in the root folder. So uh, that's in there. We could also in the instructions they are nicely organized in a data folder. That's maybe recommended. You can run this if there's no warnings. We can maybe still, I'll add one code cell there just to check that the layers look okay. So in the Helsinki polygon there's only one row of data. It's Helsinki and then there's some attributes and then the actual shape and then the grid, uh, then there's quite, quite a few columns. There's also the geometry. So these are then the input data files. I'll say a few words about the grid data. I think you used that data in exercise one where you had to create geometries based on origins and destinations. So this data is the Helsinki region travel time matrix. Uh, which has been developed in our research uh, group. Uh, so you can find the documentation from blogs.helsinki.fi-accessibility. Uh, and the data has been calculated for three different years. I think here we are working with the 2015 data set, actually. Uh, so there's, all, there's quite a few attributes. So they are all explained in here, for example, PT, RT uh, is the travel time in minutes from some origin to some destination. And then these origins and destinations are uh, statistical grid squares in the Helsinki region. So this is now a interactive map of the data. Uh, how can I zoom in from there? Uh, based on the Finnish Environment Institute YKR data set. So each of these grid squares are, they are all one polygon feature and they have a, an ID number, which is a standard code. And then based on this ID number, we can join data to this uh, spa spatial layer. And then the data, if you would download the data, they are organized in subfolders. So this is why it's, it's called matrix data because it's kind of a gridded data set that covers, co covers the Helsinki region. Uh, and then based on this data, I'll show some examples. So you could then, for example, analyze, these are a bit small, these maps, but I'll show, for example, I'll show here. So here, this is the travel time data for Helsinki Vantaa Airport in 2013. The more red, the more close, or the more short travel times. Uh, and then when we have calculated the data for two different years, here, this is after they opened the new uh, train line. So then more areas are kind of travel time-wise closer to the airport. So this is the data set that you have. And then these travel times have been calculated for each location in the Helsinki region. So there's 13,000 different text files uh, in this data set. So in the final uh, assignment, one of your tasks could be to automate different processes based on these files. So if you do one task for one of the destinations, you could repeat it for 100 different destinations with your tool. Um, that's, the, that's the quick idea here. Um, on the input data, which is now this grid. So this grid is now one, there is one uh, 
destination and then there's travel time from all the grid squares to that, that one destination by car, by public transport, by walking, so a multimodal travel time data set. Uh, okay, so let's visualize them quickly here on um, in Python. So we are now slowly, we have been kind of quickly plotting things. Next week we are diving deeper into visualization from a more cartographic point of view, but this is just now for kind of data exploration purposes. Uh, how we can make a quick plot is we can uh, do grid plot, um, just like this, for example. We might have to uh, activate this. There's this magic command, uh, sorry, in matplotlib. So percentage mark matplotlib inline, and then run it again. So you should see it visualized in the notebook. So this is the extent of the grid. Uh, you can also change the color. because we want to also then plot the other layer on top of this same thing. So when we call, oops, what is wrong? Call Olor, Olor, thanks. Um, there we go. So now, now we have a figure object which gets created when we call grid.plot. So we can, uh, or actually a subplot. So we can save that into a variable. Mm, and run it again. So it plots it, but it also saves this figure object in this AX variable. It, it refers to kind of the uh, subplot axis. So we have only one subplot in here. And then if we want to plot uh, the Helsinki polygon in the same figure, then we can do Hel Helsinki plot and then AX equals to AX. So to the same figure plot this other shape. <coughs> Mm, there we go, uh, and then let's see if this works. Hmm. Uh, we can still get rid of the kind of make a transparent plot by assigning none as the color. So this is just a quick check that our layers are actually on top of each other. Presumably they are in the same coordinate reference system, but we should, should still check that. Uh, and as a, as a little exercise, our uh, task would be then to make an overlay analysis based on these two layers. Is everybody with me? So to repeat, I'm making a plot, saving the plot object into this variable, and then uh, when plotting a geodata frame, it plots by default the geometries, uh, and then there is a parameter where we can kind of say that plot to this specific figure object. So that way we get the layers on top of each other. And as they are in the same coordinate reference system, the coordinate values of these polygons match. They actually get visualized uh, in the correct location. Mm. OK, so as I mentioned, uh, it's good to check that the coordinate reference systems match. So I'll start with grid CRS. I'll quickly print that. So it's just this uh, kind of dictionary of these PROI parameters mm, as given from the shape file. And then we can check if that equals to Helsinki CRS. That's true. So if I would only print this out, I get the exactly same representation. So two weeks ago, we talked about this different way of, of representing the coordinate reference system information. And we could, for example, have it as this well-known text string. So if the other one was EPSG uh, 3067 uh, well-known text string, and the other one was this PROI4 
representation, even though they are in the same coordinate reference systems, then this uh, comparison would yield false and then you would have to uh, redefine one or the other. But this is kind of the start, starting point for making any overlay analysis and furthermore if you now checked, so this is pre-067, uh, so that is so that's one of the most common projections used uh, in Finland. Uh, so ETRSTM35 Fin, so the Finnish uh, version of the European European-wide uh, projection, which is then in a metric metric system, as we can see. See, for example, if we would check the well-known text. Um, let's see, or pro, pro e four. So units are in meters, which is then important if we report some distances. So we need to know the unit of the CRS. Uh, okay, but this is now we are fine with this uh, format. Uh, so then we can do the overlay analysis, and I'll just show you quickly. Do I have it here? Not. Uh, what does it mean from GeoPandas documentation? So you remember we did these spatial joints, which is kind of the same but different. So there the geometries don't change. We only join attributes from one layer to the other based on spatial location. But when we do overlay analysis, we actually create new shapes. So we can kind of cookie cut things or make uh, unions or, or such. So in then the output merged layer, uh, we will have often some new geometries if there has been some kind of uh, overlay taking, taking in place. So one example would be if you would want to union things, if you think of country borders, and then countries have these exclusive economic zones. So for some application you might, might want to make a union out of those polygons and then do some further overlay analysis based on those both combined as one object. So that's one practical example that I have at least had to do. Um, yep. So there's different different uh, examples of overlay oper operations intersection, so only the common kind of spatially overlapping parts come to the output. Union takes the overlap plus the original extent so both of them combined, then difference excludes kind of the intersection and then difference uh, then depending on the order kind of reduces the extent of one from the other. And these are then for example implemented also in QGIS where from where this actually uh, the image, image is from. <coughs> mm, great. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's, we'll now try to kind of cut uh, the gray layer with the, the blue, blue layer extents using the overlay, overlay operation. Mm -hmm. So how we call this tool, uh, when making the spatial joins, we, you might call like one data frame dot merge or, or spatial join other data frame, but here we do <laughs> GPD overlay. Uh, and then we list the layers we want to compare and then how we want to compare them. Mm, in this case we do intersection. So we can run this and test if there's no complaints about the syntax. Uh, so there is some output and let's store, now that I call this the output doesn't get stored anywhere so I'll uh, store the output in a variable called intersection. intersection. There we go. Mm. And yeah, you can check check the attributes or we can plot it. So this is now 
the output of the intersection, it might seem a bit similar as spatial join in a way that we would only uh, <laughs> retain the rows from, uh, from one or the other. But if you look closely, we can actually try to make this a bit bigger, a bit ad hoc. So if I do big AX, you don't, don't yet do this if I screw it up. But <laughs> I need to first import import matplotlib type plot as plt and then plt subplots um, let's put it to i don't know did i manage um, AX equals AX. okay I can leave it like this. So you can see if you look carefully that actually uh, in the output there are all the grid squares that intersect. So you remember that intersection was that their interiors or then their borders kind of uh, overlap. But then these uh, grid squares that are at the municipality border have been actually uh, kind of cut. So there, there are some new shapes that have been generated. So in some cases you might want to do that but in other cases, you might just want to do the spatial join where you actually would then have this, like if this is the, if Helsinki, well, if this is Helsinki municipality border, then you would want to have all these included or excluded kind of the board, borderline polygons for some other output, but maybe for some visualization purposes, you want to actually cut the borders nicely. Okay, and this was now just to make make it more visible visible on the screen. Again, I defined the figure object and subplots, and then defined that plot to this specific subplot. This uh, this polygon, um, and again, we can also check the attributes. So there's all the original attributes. This is now a bit, I'll do like this in order to scroll. Uh, from both of the intersecting objects, and then there are the new shapes then in the geometry column. And this is, this is still a geodata frame object. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, so that's, that was basically it. Uh, we can finally save this file, we'll need this in the reclassification tutorial. So I have provided there, now you can take off this, well, maybe we can create a data folder, also practice, so sorry, practice that data where all these layers should be located. So from this new folder button inside your lesson four folder, uh, so then where was I? Here. So data, uh, then there's a long travel, uh, long name. So this is now travel times two, five, nine, something, something. So this number is the ID, YKR ID number of that specific destination square. Uh, and then there's, and that this square happens to be at the railway station in Helsinki. Uh, and now, just to demonstrate different data types, so we'll sa save it as a GeoJSON file, uh, which is a common format for storing uh, spatial layers. So again, we have intersection, intersection to file, uh, and then out FP, which is already defined. And now that we're using some, so shape file is the default, but if we want to save to some other uh, format, so we need to define the driver, which is then geo.json like this. You can run that. Uh, and then, depending on the file path, you should have it in here, and we can maybe even open the file. So then, this is a well, JSON file with geometry, so GeoJSON file, which then looks, this is a bit more difficult to read than a tabular data, uh, but quite often then, for example, for uh, 
plotting web maps, you would want to store your data as a GeoJSON, or somebody might request data from you as a GeoJSON. So this is one way you can do it. You can also save to GeoJSON in QGIS, I believe. Uh, okay, uh, that's kind of a quick introduction and continuation from last week. Uh, as mentioned, then there are these, you could experiment with different, different types of overlay operations depending on, on the case. Uh, and of course, then it's always good to check visually that the output is as you imagine. Sometimes things don't go so nicely, so then it might be the order of the layers or something or the coordinate reference system that's wrong. So always check visually, check the attributes uh, before then continuing a further analysis with some an output file. Um, okay. Any questions here? No. Yeah. So then another uh, geometric operation to continue with. So now that we have learned how to join data uh, or union data or intersect data, we can also then aggregate data. So data aggregation, aggregointi. I don't know if there's a better Finnish translation, but it's basically a process of kind of grouping data or reporting data in a more abstract unit. So when we're doing spatial aggregation, we are then kind of fusing, uh, fusing data into coarser units. So if you think that we would have the countries of the world, but you might want to report something on a continental level, then we can aggregate the data to a continental level uh, based on information. Then, then these country polygons should have some kind of information about the continents. Uh, so in GeoPandas we'll uh, use, and also in GIS software, generally there's uh, a technique called dissolve. So kind of the dictionary de definition for dissolve is to, that something melts from solid to liquid, so it kind of like blah, melts. So we're kind of fusing or melting data. And often it's then based on some attributes, so it would be by continent, so all the polygons that have the same continent attribute become one. So it, they kind of melt together. So that's, that's what's happening in there. Uh, so in here, uh, we could do something related to the travel time. So as you remember, the, all these grid squares now have an attribute of how long time does it take from that grid square to travel to the Helsinki railway station by public transport car and so on. Uh, and we might want to generalize the data based on that information. So um, let's, and we have the data still in this interse intersection variable for Helsinki. So let's dissolve it uh, based on travel times by public transport. So there is this, oh no, let's do car because that's in the materials. So car R T. So this, uh, let's check what this actually means. So car R D stands for distance. Uh, sorry, car R T. So travel time in minutes from one of these grid squares to the destination by private car in rush hour traffic. So we have uh, separately then kind of this midday traffic calculations and then rush hour traffic calculations in the data set. So let's, let's uh, dissolve by that. So all the grid squares that have the same travel time, for example, 30 minutes to central railway station would become one object. Uh, so we'll do it like that and that's enough. So it will kind of look, in this case, look for unique values in that column. Uh, if we would have the countries, we could do countries dissolve by continent. I think that's the example in the GeoPandas documentation. Mm. And after we've done that, let's check how many uh, rows we had intersection. <coughs> it's too difficult. Okay, we had 3,800 something grid squares in Helsinki before we started. Uh, to dissolve and then dissolve it. Let's check how many objects we have there. So now we have 51 uh, 
objects in there and I would such a so I think I didn't actually check this before but my at least according to my logic you don't have to do this I'll just demonstrate um, if I check how many unique values there are in this column so that is also the length of this dissolved object so there are now as many groups as there were unique objects uh, Yep, uh, so we can check the column names. Mm. So there are still kind of the original column names except for the one based on which we dissolved the data. At least I can't see this car RT there anymore. Uh, and then if you look at the index so these are then actually the unique values from the original data set. So if we check uh, the head, so the car RT has uh, moved uh, in on the left hand side as the index. So there are some no data values for sure. We didn't deal with those. And then there are, so of course there might be that none of the grid squares have value one. So that doesn't exist in the output. Mm -hmm. And we'll still visualize this to make it more clear. But we dissolved by uh, the car travel times, which had 51 unique values. And our, then as an output, we get a data frame with 51 columns. So we have 51 geometries, which have been kind of merged from this original layer. Uh, and we can have a closer closer look so if, if we would then want to zoom into one of those uh, those classes we can select some data we have these locator uh, indexers in pandas and geopandas similarly so for example the, all those grid squares that are located within 15 exactly 15 minutes by car from the central rail, railway station uh, are here as a combined, so there is some kind of combined geometry mm, in there. And then actually now that I'm talking, I have to admit that I'm not sure are these now the attributes from the first occurrence of those dissolved objects. We could check that. We didn't check how it then handles the other uh, other attributes mm, but we can check that a bit later uh, so if we take that I just copied it in here I'll check what is it about so this is now actually a panda series so you might have noticed when doing was it now exercise two when you had to do these distances for the user and then make line strings and stuff so you have to be all the time aware about the data types so now we had a uh, GeoPandas GeoSeries, but now of this dissolved object, we have one row, and that is actually a Pandas series. So now if we would, for example, want to plot this, all these uh, grid squares, which are 15 uh, minutes away uh, from the railway station, we have to do something, because this is a Pandas series, and Pandas series can't be plotted on a map by default without doing some tricks. So we'll see how to do that. Mm. I'll skip, skip that row. Uh, so we have to turn this column into a geo data frame. So I have this, uh, this uh, code cell here kind of semi ready. So when we construct a new geo data frame, we can call this GPD, so geopandas.geodata frame. So this would make an empty geodata frame and we could add things in there. But also you can, when constructing the object, you can give the values already. So in a way, logically, you might be doing something like this. So we can give this one row of data to uh, this constructor. But this doesn't still yet work. I'll show you. 
Y. So things have kind of gone the wrong way around. We have uh, one column, which is 20, and then we have some... So it's kind of flipped because it was a one, one series. So if you look at the documentation of how to construct, well, data frames and geodata frames, you kind of have to have a list like, for example, a dictionary of series as, as an input. And how we can kind of quickly go around that in case you in the future end up in something like this. So we can put the series as a list. So now it's there's one object in this list and that's the first row of data. And if we run that, so then we have something that looks like it has a geometry column and it has attributes. And as you remember, these are now, uh, now uh, at least the geometry is from all those grid squares, which are then uh, 50 minutes away from railway station. So I have this selection and I put it as a list. It's the first object of the list. And then furthermore, when constructing <coughs> geodata frames, we can uh, announce the coordinate reference system, which should be then the same as the dissolved objects coordinate reference system. Okay, and then again, uh, we can plot. Now I would want to plot the dissolved object and then this one selection to see what, what we have actually done uh, to the geometries. So first I start by plotting the dissolved object. Uh, it, it looks the same as the original because everything is the same color. Um, can again change the color to make the other objects visible and store this plot as a variable. And then uh, we have the selection. You can scroll up if we delete that one. You can see it's still here if you missed it. So selection uh, plot mm, ax equals ax. And we can make it Uh, red to show. So as you remember now this selection, it's the, all of these red areas are now stored in one polygon. So we could treat those if we would want to then do visualizations and such. Uh, and what the dissolve, dissolving operation did was that it took all the unique values from the car column kind of melted those all together uh, into one uh, one polygon even they are kind of kind of in different places that's that's one one object in there mm. but then of course at least to me this then makes me think about data classifications and if we would want to visualize all the classes in there so then in the next section now today we'll learn how to without having to select all these different classes yep I could think that you could group the data based on, let's say, the travel time as we did here. Uh, and then you could, you could, of course, create a visualization based on, you could pick one group from the grouped object, let's say this 15, mm -hmm. uh, and then just plot that, or then you could somehow merge those polygons, but then that's already quite a few steps. Yeah, okay. So it, so the pro process is in a way the same. I would, I would explain dissolving as group, kind of a grouping operation, but what this overlay does, or sorry, the dissolving does at the same time is to really modify the geometries. So as you saw, if we do this, or we can actually do, so we have a multi-polygon object in there instead of these, I don't remember now how many, we could calculate how many grid squares there are actually that had the value 15. So from all these grid squares, uh, ca ca 
the calculated travel time to railway station is 50 uh, minutes. So then, then yeah, you could arrive to the same same solution, but then with a bit more more steps. So yeah, the idea is is correct. Okay, um, some more ideas or questions? Yeah. in this case well I don't well of course this is a bit abstract example but then if I would be interested in let's say or maybe I would use it combined with some other other steps so you in the in the exercise you will do dissolving so you want to kind of find areas uh, based on a common attribute and then visualize those but let's say if I would want to Maybe a more useful example would be to have some like areas that are over all areas that are over 30 minutes uh, that it takes more than 30 minutes to the railway station by car or public transport make one area out of those and then do some further overlay analysis for example analyze how many people live in within that region so that would be one. Calculate the total area, some, something like this. So, of course, you, there's many things you could then do without actually merging the geometries together, but then this might make the process more short. Short in a way. So this particular example, I don't know if it's as useful as then the next one where we're actually just doing the calculation for the whole data set uh, and then doing visualizations, for example, based on that, or then some multi-criteria analysis in there. Mm, maybe there is, let's see, this one. This one. aggregation, what is the example in here? Yeah, so here is uh, the Geopandas example is, I think this is, uh, there's some natural earth countries and then it dissolves them by continent and then you can like if you don't if you want continent polygons and they don't exist you could create them based on this or let's say you would have postal code shape shapes from Finland and you're somehow lacking the municipality polygons but you have to attribute information in there then you could create the municipality polygons based on those postal codes that's maybe a more concrete example mm. Okay, then there's still, uh, I left the code in here on purpose, so still talking about geometric operations, sometimes you might want to simplify geometries. Uh, so there's now an example with this Amazon data, I need to fix the file paths for it to work, uh, which looks like this. So it has some CRS. Uh, and then, well, I would say often for visualization purposes or some more coarse calculation purposes, you might want to uh, simplify the geometries or for some web maps where you zoom out and you have more coarse uh, geometries. So there is then another function called simplify with some tolerance, which then takes the input geometries and uh, generates a simplified simplified version of that just just as a curiosity if you if you need this for some application in the future okay but that kind of concludes our geometric operations section so last week indeed those of you who were at the lesson we covered quite a big package of stuff uh, but all the materials are there uh, and also as I have shown this the Geopandas documentation also covers covers good examples of different different times. So it's always good to think that what are you what is the output that you want without like blindly starting to do some kind of joins or analysis. So what type of tab tabular data structure do you want? What type of shapes do you want? And depending on that, then select select the tool you're using. 